So it's October 14th, 2023. It's a uh, Saturday night and also the new moon lunar observance day, what we call Uposita day. And it's also pumpkin fest in Ukiah. Uh, we found that out on alms round today that uh, we just, we, we were going down State Street and the side streets were closed off and apparently, well, a lot of Ukiahans were out on the street waiting for the parade to start. So we were walking down State Street, walking past everybody and we got to the days in probably about five minutes before the parade started. So I don't know what the parade was comprised of, but it was pumpkin fest and uh, there were signs about it up and it seemed like everybody was kind of anticipating it and happy to be out on the street waiting for it to start. So whatever it was. <laughs> It's a clear change of seasons. It's a bit cooler. So there might be a little bit more heat, maybe one more heat wave or something coming, but uh, it's probably not going to last for very long. So I feel like the cool part of the year has started. There's been some rain, a little bit of rain on and off. And we've got a couple weeks left in our Vasa period. So it's a very late Vasa this year and the Vasa ends on October 29th. So there's uh, taking of precepts and I was thinking a little bit about this that uh, the lay people can hold the five precepts or can come to the monastery and take on the eight precepts, the renunciate precepts, uh, the novices hold the 10 precepts, they give up the use of money. The monks hold the 227 precepts, which are around uh, mindfulness and composure. They're uh, very good for mindfulness. And so for those of us who hold whatever level of precepts we hold, we'll to ask ourselves, what is it in us that makes us hold those precepts or that gets us to hold the precepts? And what is that quality that gets us to hold the precepts for a long time? And we become precept holders when we hold those precepts day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and through all the changing seasons and all the different changing mind states and as our bodies age and we train ourselves and mature in various ways and we keep these precepts and we do that long term through all the different mental states and that, that really is how the mind gets trained. We keep the precepts and it really changes us, it can change our character. And, uh, when we keep these precepts for a long time. So the Buddha used this phrase, sila sadha sampano, which means the precepts are perfected through faith. The precepts are kept through faith. We keep them out of faith and confidence that, that it's going to bring benefit to, to ourselves and bring benefit to others. So at first we follow these out of faith. We have faith, we have confidence. And it's not a blind faith because perhaps we've seen the benefits in others. We've maybe been to Thailand and met some of the great Ajans there, or we've met senior Western monks and uh, seen the benefits of keeping the sila, keeping the precepts long-term. And so that might have given rise to a spark of faith. And then we have faith also, not only does it lead to this keeping of precepts, but it also leads to a quality. In Pali, we call it karawa, which means respect. And we, uh, Lung Pauliam likes to use the phrase sama karawa, which is 
right respect, proper respect. So, uh, so in Thailand, there's these gestures of respect. People have forms and gestures. We have the bowing and holding the hands in Anjali. These are gestures of respect that when we have a mental state of respect, there's, there's gestures for expressing that mental state, for expressing that lovely mental state. And Tanajan Jeff likes to say that uh, respect is a sign of intelligence. So we show respect when we, we take notice. Yeah. We recognize goodness. And when we recognize something that's good, then we, it's only natural that we want to respect it. So these, uh, this faith, it leads to two things. It can lead to precepts and it leads to respect. Faith, uh, the, word, the word faith is what's normally sadha is translated as faith. But it also has a sense of confidence and it needs to be coupled with wisdom, discernment. So those things are, they balance each other out. Uh, and sila, uh, sila actually isn't precepts itself. What we, the precepts themselves are called sikapada or training guidelines, training rules. So we, that's what we do in the chant, the sikapa dang samadhi ami, I undertake this precept. The uh, sila is the internal state that comes about through the keeping of the sikapada, through the keeping of the precepts. <clears throat> so when we keep this, we take on these precepts, then it does form and mold and, and change our character in the long term. And the Buddha also said that it's a foundation, for, one of the necessary foundations for meditation, for the cultivation of the mind, the training of the mind, the uh, bhavana, the mental cultivation. And when we're keeping precepts, then whether we're sitting, standing, walking, lying down, these are benefiting us in various ways. And it's, it's very logical, very easy to see how they can benefit us. If you, if you take the five precepts, for example, the first precept of refraining from taking the life of any living creature, then any negative effect from taking life doesn't come to you. Any suffering that would accrue from taking life doesn't arise. So it, it undoes that part of suffering, yeah. taking what's not given, the second precept. We don't then come into contact with any suffering that would arise if we were to take what was not given, or uh, the third of the five precepts is not committing sexual misconduct, so having integrity in our relationships, not cheating on our partners, uh, not having those types of affairs, and so we don't come into contact with any suffering or stress which might, which will come to us if we don't keep that precept. So it cuts out a whole lot of suffering and stress. The fourth precept of refraining from dishonesty, refraining from lying, that uh, cuts out a whole bunch of dukkha, a whole bunch of suffering, a whole mass of suffering, just imagining that uh, any suffering that comes from that happens when we are dishonest, that won't come to us. And then we refrain from taking intoxicants and uh, specifically in the precept, it's worded as uh, like uh, alcohol, but we, we extend it to like drugs and alcohol and all of the immense suffering that comes from substance abuse and whatnot, then that doesn't come to us. So even just something like the five precepts really cuts out a whole mass of suffering just through virtue of keeping the precepts, not even to speak of mental cultivation. So we 
use our logical, rational mind and we see that benefit, and that, that gives rise to sadha, which is, we're translating as faith, but it's not a, it's not like you have to have faith in this. It's, it's more like a confidence. I, uh, maybe it's not exactly confidence, also as conviction, maybe, could be conviction. Uh, seeing that it's going to be beneficial, so uh, so then we do it. <clears throat> There's also this uh, quality of generosity that the Buddha speaks of, and there's these various types of giving that are that are important to be cultivating in the practice. So. This is also one of the foundations of the practice, in addition to sila, in addition to this thing we call virtue, then uh, dana, the, the generosity, is also a big foundation for us. And we learn how to, the Buddha talks about learning how to give with an open hand, you know, not with a closed fist. So we learn how to uh, look after each other. We learn how to give. We give gifts at the right time. We give gifts with discernment. And so uh, then when we learn how to be generous, then there's, it's only natural that we develop these internal qualities of generosity. This is chaga, which is relinquishment, or learning how to let go in the mind. So generosity is a foundation for that. External generosity is a foundation for that. And so then when we actually sit in meditation, then we can let go of all sorts of things. And that's a like generosity towards ourselves. So giving, externally we say dana, which is giving, and chaga is like giving up. So internally we have this quality of giving up and then that leads to peace. So when we aren't able to give up internally when we have all sorts of thoughts and proliferations around whatever around the world and we're not able to give that up or we have thoughts and proliferations about our particular way of seeing things, our views and opinions. We aren't able to give that up and then the meditation isn't very peaceful or isn't peaceful at all because we can't stop really fabricating these things. And then when we have chaga, we're able to give these things up. So it's giving up our views and opinions, giving up our stances about things. And the mind can become very wieldy, very malleable. The phrase in the sutta is malleable, fit for work, you know, bright, these, uh, Keywords like bright, clean, uh, fresh, refreshed. Uh, so the the mind can have these these different qualities. Uh, certainly not stressed. Uh, and then the mind can also have these different qualities. The of the Brahma Viharas, which is. Metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, the goodwill, compassion, rejoicing, and equanimity. And these are for letting go of, or say, liberating ourselves from different other qualities. So, uh, metta, uh, goodwill, is for liberating the mind from hostility, from ill will. I prefer the translation hostility. It uh, seems a bit more accurate. Thoughts of hostility. And then compassion. Karuna is for liberating the mind through from thoughts of cruelty, thoughts of harming. Uh, rejoicing, mudita, that's for liberating the mind from thoughts of resentment. And upeka is for liberating the mind from thoughts of lust, 
And so we can develop these four Brahma Viharas to develop the higher mind. And that's, that's also part of the mental cultivation, part of the bhavana. Yeah, and it's kind of mysterious why we do these things, why we feel inspired to practice, to, and then why we stick with it. So, uh, and the Buddha talks about also about doing this practice and say, you have, so you have dana, and then you have sila, and bhavana, and then with these these different qualities, then. Uh, he talks about the possibility of, of the mind being liberated from suffering. So when we come to practice, then there's that, there'll be those moments where the rubber meets the road, where we get tested in our practice and we might come up against criticism or uh, or something disagreeable happens to us or some sort of disagreeable interaction in the community. And then that's where we get tested in our, in our practice. Where is our, where is our practice actually at? And, or when we feel like there's some sort of difficulty, like we're, maybe we fall ill or we feel tired or there's some sort of pain in the body how do we, uh, how do we respond to that? So letting go is also has a meaning of skillful response. So how do we respond to these uh, to these different states that uh, that arise in our lives? And this is a quality uh, we call kanti or, or patient endurance. So uh, that's, uh, that's also a very important quality to have as we go about the practice. And, uh, it's kind of interesting when the Buddha gave Dhamma talks to lay people, he didn't tend to talk about meditation so much or the bhavana aspect, but he did talk about dana and sila. So these kind of basic, uh, tangible things uh, that we can do. And uh, yeah, most of us might, might feel like we want to bhavana, but uh, it is difficult. So uh, it means we're gonna come up against ourselves, means we're gonna call into question our cravings and longings and um, actually have times where we, we go against those. And the very nature of craving is that when you go against it, it's difficult experiences. We experience difficulty if we go against our own cravings. And also the nature of craving or the nature of desire, say a tanha, the desire that's a cause of suffering, the nature of it is it it desires, it doesn't, it doesn't get, it doesn't go away by fulfilling it because if it went away by fulfilling it, it wouldn't be desire. Desire is just desire. And uh, whether we fulfill it or not, it's still there. It's, uh, so there's this, that's the delusion that's speaking to us that says, oh, when you get what you want, that, feeling is going to be fulfilled or it's going to go away. So desire is a type of suffering. Desire is suffering here and now. You could say that. And it's suffering because the desire is saying, well, you need something that you don't have right now. You need to get something. You need to experience something that is going to make this it's gonna make it better. It's gonna make the desire go away. But then when we do get that thing or we do fulfill our desire, the desire doesn't go away. It's still there. And that's, that's the story of our lives. So that, that's just 
how we operate. That's, that's how it is for everybody. So it's kind of interesting that the Buddha says, well, this desire, this, this craving is the cause of suffering. It's not that we don't, haven't yet gotten what we don't have that's the cause of suffering. You know, it's not that this external situation or this person is the cause of my suffering. It's not that anything is the cause of my suffering other than my desire to have things be different than what they are now. That's actually the cause of the suffering. But it's subtle, it's hard to see, so we have to keep coming back to that. So we can know, the you know, first noble truth, I'm suffering, we can know that. The second noble truth, craving being the cause of suffering. We can know that too, but it eludes us because we're always thinking, it's so common to think, well, it's this other person that's the cause of my suffering. It's this situation that's the cause of my suffering. You know, it's this government that's the cause of my suffering. It's this monastery that's the cause of my suffering. It's this precept that's the cause of my suffering. It's this food that's the cause of my suffering. That's where our mind goes. But it's just the craving. It's the craving. It's the wanting it to be otherwise. That's the cause of the suffering. It's that I'm not enlightened yet that's the cause of my suffering. So we can even, we can run ourselves around in, in circles like that. It's that I have to stay up late is the cause of my suffering. Another thing that's important to recollect is, is peace, that we're here to experience peace. And that can happen when we, in those moments when we do relinquish the desire for things to be otherwise, or relinquish, relinquish craving, those brief moments when that happens, then the mind can calm down a little bit and it could be peaceful. So that's why we practice meditation every day. That's why we come together in the morning and do our morning chanting and meditation. That's why we come together in the evening and do our chanting and meditation. It's so the mind can learn how to let go. The mind can learn how to be peaceful. It's not really for anything else. It's not to achieve something really great. But it's just, it's just so the, the mind can learn how to be peaceful. That's uh, probably good for this evening. So we have this, uh, we have this opportunity to uh, to practice this evening, and um, I think I'll uh, I'll leave it there. <laughs>